Hello and welcome back to Linear Algebra, the video series where we talk about vector spaces and the things we can do in them. And indeed, in today's part 58, we will extend everything we already had to the complex realm. This means, finally, we are allowed to calculate with complex vectors and complex matrices. However, before we start with that, I first want to thank my nice supporters on Steady, here on YouTube or on Patreon. And please don't forget, additional material and the book about linear algebra you find with the link in the description. Okay, with that I would say let's start with the topic of today, which is about complex vectors and complex matrices. And the reason we want to go into these complex cases is because of the set of eigenvalues, the spectrum of a matrix A. Even if the matrix only has real entries, it's better to see the spectrum as a subset of the complex numbers. This is due to the fundamental theorem of algebra as we have discussed it in former videos. This means, in eigenvalue theory, the complex numbers are the better choice. So by extending our vectors and matrices, we make this theory better. Hence, from now on, we also want to consider vectors from Cn. Of course, this is the same as Rn, but now with complex numbers as entries. And of course, exactly the same we will also do with matrices. So essentially, nothing changes here in the definition, just the elements, the entries for matrices and vectors come now from a bigger number set. However, with that choice, our eigenvalue theory gets much better. Okay, then I would say, let's put that into a definition. So if we write Cn, we just mean the normal column vectors with n entries. However, now the only difference is that now the entries come from the complex number set. So for example, we could have the element i plus 2 in the first component and 1 in the second component. And then this is a well-defined element in C2. So not complicated at all, but something we have to write down. And we have the same for the matrices. For an m times n matrix, we write C to the power m times n. Also there, we just look at an example and then you know how it works. So we could have i0 and i minus 1, 2. Indeed, this is a well-defined 2 times 2 matrix. So you see, we don't have a problem defining the sets, but for linear algebra, it's more important that we have all the operations. And you already know, for vectors in linear algebra, we need exactly two operations. Namely, addition and scalar multiplication. However, now we should also be able to multiply with scalars from C. Okay, and with that, you know you can write down the definition and it looks exactly the same as in Rn. However, please note, the addition sign here on the right hand side is the addition in C. And the same for the multiplication sign, which is the multiplication in C as well. In other words, what happens entry-wise here is what happens with complex numbers. So it's important that you know how to multiply two complex numbers. And then it's no problem at all to push this to Cn as well. And then everything works exactly the same. We can calculate in Cn as we have calculated in Rn before. The reason for this is that here we have a new example of a so-called vector space. So we say the set Cn becomes a vector space together with the two operations addition and scalar multiplication. And more precisely, we would call it a complex vector space simply because the scalars we can multiply with are complex numbers. In fact, this is different from before because now scaling with complex numbers also makes sense. Maybe it's harder to visualize, but in the end, the operation is exactly the same in calculations. Okay, here I would say it's helpful to recall all the properties we have put to a vector space. First, we need that the set together with the vector addition is a so-called abelian group. And this means we have exactly four properties, which are not so complicated and listed here. So you see, setting the parentheses as we want is what we call associative. 
Having a zero element that does nothing is what we call a neutral element. And having an inverse with respect to this neutral element is what we also require for all these. And then the last one just tells us that the addition is also commutative. Okay, and then we go to our second operation, the scalar multiplication. And this one has two inputs, a scalar from C and a vector from Cn. And of course the output is again a vector from Cn. And now we say that this operation is compatible if we can mix it up with the multiplication in C. And moreover, scaling with the unit element in C should not change the vector at all. Okay, and then the last thing we need are distributive laws, so laws that connect both the addition and the scalar multiplication. They always look the same, they just say you can multiply the scalar to two vectors, and in the same sense, you can multiply a vector to two scalars. However, here please keep in mind, all the scalars involved are complex numbers. Okay, and with that, we have stated the eight rules again that define a so-called vector space. And now the only difference to Rn is now that we have a scalar multiplication with complex numbers. And that's the reason we call it a complex vector space. However, you should see, all the properties here are literally the same and therefore also all calculation rules are exactly the same as in Rn. So nothing really changes, which also means we can adopt all the other notions as well. This means all the definitions, for example, for subspaces, the span, linear independence, basis, dimension, look all the same if we replace Rn with Cn in the definition. And that's exactly what we will do, but without writing it down again. However, one thing I want to point out, and this is the notion dimension. For this, please first verify that with the canonical unit vectors here, we can form a basis of Cn again. Simply because we are allowed to multiply in the scalar multiplication with complex numbers. Hence, now it's allowed to scale this vector, for example, with a factor i. Therefore, we can form every vector in Cn with these canonical unit vectors again. Therefore, this fact here implies that the dimension of Cn is exactly n. So maybe not a surprise at all, but still it's a little bit against our visualization. Simply because it means that the dimension of the complex numbers as vector space is equal to 1. There, please recall, usually we would visualize the complex numbers as something with two axes. However, these are two real axes, and in the complex realm, this is still just one degree of freedom. Therefore, saying the mention of C is equal to 1 is correct, but maybe we should emphasize that we mean a complex dimension here. So we see it as a vector space where we are allowed to scale with complex numbers. And as I said before, this is indeed the only difference in our definition. So don't be confused. All the calculations work the same as before, but maybe our visualization for complex vector spaces is not so good anymore. But I would say that's definitely something we get used to after some time. Okay, and now the last thing I want to define in this video about the complex vector space Cn is the so-called standard inner product. So we already know that for Rn, and now we extend this definition such that we can also put in vectors from Cn. In fact, we will also use the same symbol with the pointed brackets. And now from Rn, you already know, it's defined by multiplying the components and adding them. And now, actually, we could use the same definition here in Cn, however, this will lead to problems. Because you know, with this inner product, we want to measure angles, but also lengths. Indeed, the length of a vector is what we call the norm of u. And as in Rn, we would define it as the square root of the inner product with u with itself. Therefore, inside this square root here, we would sum up the squares of the components. However, squares of complex numbers could be negative, hence what we actually want are the absolute values squared. So for complex numbers, we cannot omit the absolute values inside the square. 
Indeed, in the end, we need something positive or zero below the square root such that we get a length out. And with that we see, in the definition of the inner product, we need a complex conjugation. So you see, what we do is that we put the complex conjugation to the entries of the first vector in the inner product. So that's definitely something you should remember. Inner products in complex vector spaces always need a complex conjugation in the definition. Otherwise, we would have a problem defining a well-defined length. And in the case of Cn, this length here is what we call the standard norm of the vector u. And maybe for that, we should give a quick example. So let's calculate the standard norm of the vector i minus 1. So now we know we have a big square root and squares inside. However, we don't have i squared, we have the absolute value of i squared. That makes a difference, because otherwise we would have a negative number here, because i squared is minus 1. But now with the absolute values, we get out 1 plus 1, so the length here is the square root of 2. So you see, we calculate with complex numbers a lot here, but in the end, the length, the norm, should still be a real number. More precisely, a non-negative real number. Okay, with all that, we are now ready to go into complex linear algebra with the next videos. So I really hope that I see you there, and have a nice day. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.